Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Miha Stanku. I'm the Sales and Support Engineer at Iwara. Welcome all to today's webinar, uh, which is called Bioretention Modeling for Healthy Plants Using Music, uh, held by Dr. Dale Brown of E2 Design Lab. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you guys have an idea how to participate in today's event. If you would like to join over the phone rather than um, audio, please select telephone in the audio pane and then dial in information will be displayed. The audio pane is to the top right. You will have the opportunity to submit uh, text questions to Dr. Dale by typing your questions into the questions pane also on the control panel on to the right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, we will collect all the questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would like now to hand the webinar over to Dale. Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the, the webinar this morning. Um, I hope you can all hear me. So, Today I've been asked to, to give a little talk on music and the chosen, the chosen topic is to talk about urban greening and modelling soil moisture in music which is uh, something that's relatively newish but something we've been doing for a little while but is now becoming broadly available to everybody. So um, urban greening is something that is kind of the flavour of the month. At the moment, what we're seeing is a lot of councils are doing urban forest strategies and they're setting for themselves quite ambitious urban canopy targets and something in the order of 40% of open space they're aiming to have covered by a canopy um, by a certain time frame. Um, sometimes those time frames and, and the dollars associated with them haven't all been thought through and so there's an opportunity for us to, to step in and help some of these councils to meet some of these targets. And, I assume that some of the people we've got joining us today are probably from council, some of you are probably other, other consultants and, and modelers like myself, I assume. So, if we give a bit of background, um, what we see is conventional drainage, water's running down the gutter, um, essentially bypassing the tree and there's a missed opportunity for passive irrigation and sitting right beside that what we have is a tree in a pit, uh, nice sealed concrete surfaces all around it and essentially the outcome of this is we have an unhealthy tree, unhappy tree with not a great deal of canopy cover and then the water is basically going right past it. So obviously there's a few issues with this set up and we'd like to rethink how we go about some of our, our streetscape designs. So you could say that we are essentially on the same journey. Stormwater offers a range of potential benefits for green, it can provide irrigation, it can help improve tree health and also the canopy cover and we can also get better microclimate outcomes if we've got stormwater or water going to our trees. On the flip side, we can also provide some, some benefits for our water system for vegetation. So we can provide stormwater treatment through bioretention or rain gardens or through tree pits. We can provide a certain level of flow attenuation, although we shouldn't overstate that. And we can also locally use the urban excess. So we're helping to reduce flow volumes going into our waterways, which then helps to reduce the, the adverse impacts we're having on waterways through extra, extra water going into them. Sorry, we're not responding, there we go, that's better. So we've been doing a little bit of work with one of the suppliers of products, uh, City Green, and essentially what we're looking at doing is combining two different technologies. So the first one is the conventional tree pit, and what we've been looking at is trying to make sure that we provide enough soil volume for a tree by providing uh, structural soils or in this case these strata cells so that there's expanded soil volume for the tree so it's got more soil and the idea is that the more soil we provide the larger the canopy for the tree can grow. We have better soil quality because we're providing soil that's suitable for the tree rather than necessarily a bioretention media and then we also have the option of having sort of porous pavements and the like sitting over it so it can allow oxygen to get through. 
but that doesn't give us water. On the other side, we've got a bioretention system, so that has more soil volume. We have some issues around soil quality because filter media isn't necessarily the ideal soil to be chucking trees into, and obviously we have problems around having pavement because with a standard rain garden, we like to have that nicely vegetated, so we can't chuck a pavement on top like the one you can see on the left. And of course, we have lots of stormwater flowing into them usually. So the idea is to try and put these together come up with a tree pit where we have a soil volume that can support a healthy tree, pavement sitting over the top, and then we just have a smaller tree pit around the tree. So this raises a few questions. What, what tends to happen in streetscapes? Uh, we're all accustomed to sizing our systems with music and getting it down to the nth degree of best practice, so it's 45.01% and 80% for TSS or whatever we're aiming for. But with streetscapes, what invariably happens is you end up designing your tree pits to fit the space that's available and to treat the catchment that's coming to it. So what you end up needing to do is to actually have tree pits that are a range of different sizes relative to their catchment. And so we come to the question, well, how big can we make this tree pit and still be confident that enough water is going to come in and keep the tree going and keep it alive? And on the flip side, how small can we make it? Because sometimes we're really constrained for space. But be sure that one, the tree isn't getting so much water that we effectively drown it. And secondly, that it's actually still meeting our stormwater treatment objectives, which usually is our constraint. Some other things that might be interesting to think about is what effect does some additional soil volume or some additional water actually have on canopy cover? Can we get some better outcomes? And what are the costs and benefits look like for this kind of system? So I guess to give you a little bit of background and step back a couple of years for us, we've spent some time doing audits of bioretention systems in a couple of different councils around Melbourne, and we've been talking to some people interstate as well. And what we're finding, contrary to popular expectations, we thought we'd get out there and find that half of them had failed due to clogging. What we're finding is that hardly any of these systems are failing due to clogging, but what is happening is that we're tending to put media in them that is coarser and holds less soil moisture than even the Forbes specs recommend, and certainly less than what we think would be desirable to support plants and particularly to support trees. So what we are finding is that anything up to 70 or 80 percent of the rain gardens in some municipalities are failing because the media is too sandy and it's not holding enough moisture to keep things alive. Um, so we've done a project with Melbourne Water called Bioretention in the West and that has been looking at some design approaches to try and make sure that we get some successful bioretention systems in these drier, slightly more arid areas where we can be confident that they're surviving. So I should put a caveat where we're looking at these soils. So we need to be mindful that it's a careful balance. We don't want the soil to be too sandy. We don't want to be going above the Forbes spec, above 200 millimetres an hour hydraulic conductivity. But at the same time, we don't want to be going back the other way into a soil that's got so much nutrients that we're seeing the nutrients start to leach through the system. So it's a careful balancing act. So our example for today, what we did is we looked at a Brisbane car park. So on the left, you can see the conventional design. Essentially, uh, let me see if we get the mouse working, you can see we've got an array of tree pits through the car park, try and provide some shade for the cars, uh, reduce some of the, the heat loads coming off, off these car parking surfaces, and then up in the top left corner, sorry, top right corner, you'll see we've got a bioretention system to do the stormwater treatment. And in this case, we've also got a small rainwater tank on the retail area. Our test case, what we've done, instead of having the bioretention and instead of having standard tree pits, what we've done is we've put in these strata flow tree pits which have an expanded soil volume. They have stormwater draining to them to provide passive watering um, and then they have structural pavement, suspended pavement sitting over the top of them. So what this means firstly is that you see the bioretention now disappears is and in this case they've chosen to turn it into a couple of car parks. The other thing that happens is that these trees can now grow bigger than they would have previously. So I guess um, a little bit of 101, I'll assume most of you are pretty familiar with music and pretty familiar with bioretention systems, but for anyone that's not so familiar, essentially you have rainfall falling on those systems, you have evapotranspiration, we have inflow coming in, to the system from the surrounding impervious pavement around it, and that flows into the surface storage in the system. It ponds up, 
fills up to a certain level and then infiltrates down through the media. If it reaches the extended detention depth, it will spill over the overflow. Now, in this case, we're assuming pretty shallow extended detention depths. We're working with 50 or 100 mil because we're assuming we don't have a lot of leeway in these car parks or in the streetscapes to have large extended detention depths. A um, couple of considerations here. In music, music does not represent the rainfall, so you have to represent that separately yourself um, in your catchments. It does represent evapotranspiration of these systems and it represents inflow for other areas. My preferred method for representing the rainfall is to use a small catchment that's the same size as the treatment with a zero rainfall threshold and a 100% impervious fraction. And what that does is that makes sure you've got that water coming into your treatment system being represented. And in these cases where we're dealing with big systems um, relative to their catchment, sometimes that can become important. Water infiltrates into the media and if the soils are unsaturated, that's according to the unsaturated hydraulic conductivity of the soil, which is determined based on the soil moisture. And so the water will infiltrate at that rate. Once the inflow exceeds that, water will start to pond at the top. The soil will eventually start to saturate and then we move into a Darcy flow situation where the head of water that is ponding and the saturated hydraulic conductivity in the soil will dictate the infiltration rate through the system. Um, there's a couple more things that happen with submerged zones, but we're not really dealing with those today. Now, just one comment I'll say, you'll notice we've got gravel drainage layer on the bottom. What I will say is that for tree pits, it's preferable not to have this being an extensive layer across the entire tree, but rather maybe just a strip on the side of the tree so that we're not interfering with the roots too much. So the interesting bits that you all here to hear, modelling and analysis. So obviously we, we did the estimation of stormwater treatment performance, which is what we're usually using music for. And then the second thing we did is we looked at likely soil moisture conditions and we looked at the wetting and drying cumulative frequency patterns and we also looked at the spells of drying to try and get an understanding of, of how often and how long these trees are drying out for. So we looked at a few different variables. We looked at Brisbane and Canberra uh, climates and we've also done some work in the west of Melbourne since that time. We looked at a range of catchment error ratios from half a percent right through to 20%, so a very broad range in this case of potential treatment sizes. And then we looked at a couple of soil types. The first was just a loamy sand in music terminology, often referred to as a sandy loam, uh, filter media, just to confuse everyone, assuming that that's got an infiltration rate of 200 millimetres an hour. And then the second thing we did is we said, what if we had a sandy loam that didn't have such a high infiltration rate, holds a little bit more soil moisture against gravity and is a bit more conducive to growing the trees but is still a low nutrient mix. So think of a, a native veg mix for example. We then thought about how much water do trees actually use and so we set a, a kind of a low water use tree and then a high potential water use tree that, that will use a high amount of water when it can but is able to ratchet down when it doesn't have that available. And we got some expert advice. Um, compliments of one of the lecturers up in in Queensland from one of the unis to advise us on what sort of evapotranspiration rates we should be looking at. Um, interestingly, the high figures actually came in lower than what music has as a default for Carex, so that was an interesting learning for us. So modelling these in music, the models are deceptively simple. Essentially, we have a catchment and then it's draining into a tree pit and that's it. We assumed a 90% impervious fraction because of the catchments we're dealing with, um, essentially car parks and streetscapes, so they're almost entirely impervious areas. As I said, very shallow extended detention depth. Uh, don't get thrown by the surface area here. This is a unit model, so we're modelling something like a one hectare catchment into 450 square metres. We're actually representing much smaller systems. We're just doing that so that the numbers coming out of music are a bit easier to, to handle. We're not getting point oh oh ones and the like. So key things that we dealt with, the filter media soil type, we varied that between the sandy loam and the loamy sand depending on the soil that we were using. And what that does is it influences the equation in music that calculates the hydraulic conductivity relative to the, the soil moisture. <coughs> 
Second thing we did is we varied the PET scaling factor, which calculates what the PET for the system is relative to the, the standard PET being fed into the model. So we, we varied that with a higher number for the high water use and then a lower number for the low water use. Um, obviously we had to export flux files and in music version 6.2 you can export a flux file and you can get the bioretention soil moisture. When we did this we didn't have that luxury so we're actually exporting some files from the back end and then post-processing those but that's much easier for you to do now. And this is the kind of stuff we had coming out of our modelling. So what we did is a cumulative frequency plot of soil moisture. Is that visible on the, I hope you can see the right side of that. My right side's a little bit cut off. Um, so what we have is cumulative frequency that shows you on the left side is the, the soil moisture as a percentage of porosity and then running across the bottom it's showing the percentage of time that that particular soil moisture is being exceeded. So what you can see, the light blue line here is what we call the field capacity for the soil. So if these lines are above that, that means that the soil at that present time has free water in it that is able to freely drain but hasn't yet had the opportunity to do so. We then have between the field capacity and the optimal soil moisture, this is essentially where we want to be. So the the plants are at optimal soil moisture or somewhere above it, but they're not yet at field capacity. So that's ideally where we'd like our systems to spend most of their life. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, it seems to be depressingly little time and we were quite surprised when we first looked at these graphs. These systems actually seem to spend very little of their time in that range. Finally, we drop below the optimum soil moisture and then at this point the plants are becoming stressed and they work their way down towards the wilting point at which point the plants can't effectively take up any soil moisture from the soil at all. So once we get to wilting point the plants are really in trouble and we don't want them to spend much time below that at all if we can avoid that. And the final one um, for the scientists among us is the hygroscopic point and that's essentially when all of our protranspiration ceases. Uh, sorry, um, um, evaporation, I should say. <clears throat> so <sighs> the challenge here is that we can create these graphs, but then the question is how do we interpret them? So we had to come up with some ideas about what we thought might represent a typical system, and those three you see in the middle is probably not too far off that. And then you can see we've got this blue one right over on the side and it's spending a very large percentage of its time on the wet range. So the question is, is this too wet perhaps? Um, so we're seeing this one, it's, it's more than 90% of its life, it's, it's draining through essentially. So we'd question whether that system probably is getting too much water and whether the plants can survive. Now that's not cut and dried. If this was stagnant water, this, these plants would probably be in trouble. But because we've got water flowing through these systems, they will actually bring some oxygen with the water coming through it, which will help the plants. So they may actually cope with that. It would be suggesting that something in this range that we're seeing is probably getting too wet for our comfort. On the flip side, this is plotting up some of the, the larger size ratios now. What we see is that these systems are now going below the optimal soil and moisture for a much larger percentage of the time. In this case, it's about 20%. Um, we've seen more ones that are more like 60 or even 50% on some of the other examples we're looking at. So you can see that they're, they're now spending much more life at a point where the plants are actually experiencing stress and we can expect that they'll probably have more difficulty growing in these conditions. Um, so to look at this in a little bit more detail, what we also thought about was what are the spells? So sure we can see percentage of time, but what does that mean in terms of spells? So what we've done is plotted up the spells when the plants and the soil moisture are actually below wilting point. So this is a case study for Brisbane with a system designed for best practice with sandy loam, so that's the finer media. And what we see is that what we've got on the bottom here is the number of days that the spell lasts for, and then on the, the vertical axis, the frequency with which that occurs. So for example, we've got one spell that's about 23 days is the longest. We've got two spells of about eight days. So what we're saying is that the plant's below wilting point and basically has no water available for up to 22, 23 days, at least once in our modeling period, which is 10 years, and there's a couple of times when it's eight or nine days and five when it's two or three and so forth. So 
we've looked at a few different ones of these. So if I take you now to a larger system relative to its catchment, what you see is that that story now changes quite a bit and we're now talking much longer dry spells where the plants basically have no water available to them for in excess of a month. We're talking up to about 38 days. So we set a target for this that we'd like to see that they're not going below wilting point for more than about 35 days at a time and that's sort of a guide for what something pretty hardy like carex or something like a tree um, can potentially cope with assuming it's got you know, access to some deeper soils and it might be able to get a bit of water from other sources. We're reasonably confident they can cope with those kind of conditions for that time. This one here at 20% we're saying sort of 38, 39 days. We put a question mark on this and whether this might be a bit too dry. So looking at a few of these together, so what we've plotted is just a whole bunch of spells for um, a system with a range of different catchment sizes, ranging through from your 1% here through to your 20%. And so what we can do now is we can start to look at at what point do these start to go above our, our nominal target threshold of 35 days and we start to see you know, the 15 to 20% ranges in this particular case are starting to look a bit dry and we'd be a bit nervous about these systems having enough water and potentially drying out and the trees dying. Um, so we then went, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, but obviously we ran a lot more of these. This is, I think, about 60 models you're looking at on this graph here. So, so we did a lot of these spells graphs. Um, and then we basically took that and used that, distilled it, went through and come up with a set of sizing ranges for these systems. So these are some of the outcomes that we're getting. So for South East Queensland, what we came up with is that if you're less than about 3.8% of your catchment, you're probably not meeting your best practice treatment targets and you're probably getting in the danger zone of being too wet. If you're going above 10% of catchment, we're concerned that those systems would be too dry and your system would be under threat of losing your tree and that's probably a significant risk at that point. Uh, for Brisbane climate, being mindful that they do have a, a pretty dry, um, sort of dry, dry season. We also looked at Canberra and it's worth saying that the Canberra results were almost exactly the same as the Melbourne results. So this is fairly uh, comparable and transferable. So again, below 1.4%, not meeting best practice. Anywhere between 1.4 and 2%, we're meeting best practice, but we'd put a question mark on their systems where they might be getting too wet. Um, at some times of the year, we'd be a bit concerned. And then once you start getting above 5% in this case, we're a bit concerned that they're getting too dry. So that sweet spot is really between about 2 and 5%, we think. Um, keeping in mind that this is all for the higher water use trees that we're talking about here. The low water use trees universally had very wet conditions and we ended up uh, not using them too much. So in terms of stormwater treatment performance, we have um, we compared our base case system with our tree pits and what you can see is that the tree pits are actually outperforming our alternative system consistently um, and that's because we've now got more area because we're no longer designing our systems to just try and make them as small as we can. We're designing them to try and maximise our tree up Outcomes. And what that means is that we actually find we can easily meet our stormwater treatment outcomes because we're shooting for canopy targets and so forth. So just quickly, what happens to your tree canopy? Because I know a few people here are going to be interested in that. And what you see is as your soil volume on the right, on the, sorry, on the left side increases, the amount of tree canopy that that can support increases. So essentially, there's a relationship between the amount of soil your tree's got and the amount of canopy. Now the green graph here is if you have tree canopy with no irrigation and then the grey graph is tree canopy with irrigation. So what you see is as soon as we add water to these you have a huge uplift in the amount of tree canopy you can support. So there's a great benefit in having tree canopy, uh, sorry, in having water and passive in irrigation so we can support more tree canopy. And then if we then add that with more soil volume we find we can get six, eight, even 12 times as much canopy for the same standard tree pit that we might otherwise be putting in. So huge potential benefits. So that's your base case um, down here and then at the lower end and then this is the modified system up here so you'll see gone from about 1.8 metres of tree canopy diameter up to about five and a half. 
So benefits, in Brisbane we found that our fancy tree pits essentially were the equivalent of putting 12 standard trees in. We found some other research that suggested they might live three times as long. We got back the equivalent of about 0.7 of a car space and you can put a dollar value on what the car space is worth. I'd much rather see that retained as green vegetated space but obviously there's some trade-offs we have to consider there. And then finally it's capturing and removing your sediment and meeting your stormwater targets. So that's it for me. So I might um, open it up to questions and we'll have a look at the, some of the questions that are coming through. Um. Okay. All right, so I'll start with the first question. I've got three questions so far, so if anyone has any others, please feel free to pop them through. So the first question is, can you please elaborate on the recommended soil properties to enhance tree health without creating leaching, specifically organic matter specification? To what extent do you think the type rather than quantity of organic matter affects the leaching of nutrients? Now. This is, a, this is probably the toughest question I could be asked and I knew it would come up, so thank you, Jack. Um, yes, so the matter of organic matter and leaching has been hotly debated in some, some of the recent forums. It's probably worth saying that the critical thing to consider here is stability of the organic matter. There are many different types of organic matter you can have in soil. and Really what we're looking for is a stable soil matrix where what organic matter is present is bound up and well mixed in with the other soil and with the other materials so that it's not rapidly breaking down um, and being um, leached out by the water. So obviously some organic matter like wood chips and the like are going to be slower to break down and more amenable to that than you know, pea straw or something which might break down quite rapidly. Um, there's been extensive research done in the States where they've tested a whole range of different systems with compost. They've had lots of trouble with those systems leaching, so they've had difficulties with those. Um, on the flip side, I'm still firmly of the view that, that we can find systems that have higher amounts of natural organic matter, particularly those that are in soils themselves, that are still stable and won't leach as rapidly um, and obviously that the area of exploring composts and recycled materials that can be added um, in a manner that's stable is an area of, of interest for everyone doing research in this area. Um, what, we are, what we've been testing recently is, is trying to look for sandy loams rather than loamy sands that have a higher content of loam and, and silt in them and a lower content of sand and a higher content also of finer sand. And what we're after here, it's worth keeping in mind, we're not looking at increasing the organic content per se. What we're trying to increase is the soil moisture holding capacity of the soil. So an average Forbes spec filter media might be around 50, 15 to 20 percent. We're trying to find stuff that's at least 20 percent or higher soil moisture retention capacity if we can um, is sort of the preferred thing. So that's, I'll, I'll leave that one at that. Um, so I'll have a look at the next question. So this is a lady from Darwin and they've asked the question, do we see these pits as a potential feasibility in a wet, dry, seasonal environment? So um, some of you will know that Darwin has a particularly challenging environment for bioretention and rain garden systems where you have three to four months of dry period in the summer, of, of in the dry season rather, and then you have a lot of water in the wet season. Now it is more difficult to design those systems and establish them in a sustainable way in this environment. Um, a couple of things worth considering is the opportunity to have something like a submerged zone and that may be the traditional submerged zone where we have a, a stone reservoir sitting underneath our tree pit or our rain garden which holds water or it may actually be we're allowing water to penetrate and be banked in the clay soils sitting underneath. Um, so there's different ways of achieving a, a water bank that the trees can access through that dry period. The challenge is to try and get enough water in there that they can keep accessing some water right through a three or four month dry period potentially at times. Um, my feeling is that, that it 
is potential to do these, it is probably worth considering accepting that you may need to come and water some of these trees at some point during that dry season and perhaps you won't have to water them as much as other trees but you may still have to give them some watering in, a, in exceptional dry periods. Um, so the third question is a quick one, just will the notes slides be available for future reference? We will PDF these and they'll be available through the eWater website. And then the fourth question that's come through is how amenable are councils to this type of treatment? It's probably fair to say that it is variable. Some councils will be very open to it. So we're seeing in Melbourne, we're seeing City of Melbourne, um, City of Port Phillip putting in passive infiltrated uh, street trees themselves and they've come up with a, a range of their own designs. They're putting in some of these systems that we're seeing. We've seen some going up in, I think, around Gold Coast and people are also, also talking about um, putting them in, in Brisbane. Um, so we're seeing them implemented in Brisbane as well and City Green have established these systems in a number of different cities around Melbourne and also quite a few in the states. So. Um, the smarter councils are realising the benefits of these systems is not just about getting stormwater treatment, but they can actually get canopy cover. So those councils that are looking to achieve canopy cover, this is a great way of doing it and it can potentially be more cost effective than just bunging in trees into your streets and hoping they'll, they'll survive. So fifth question has just come through. I mentioned a method for modelling rainfall data for the tree pits, so um, just ask me if I could please explain that again. So the first point there is that music does not represent rainfall falling directly on any of the stormwater treatment systems in it. The assumption is that the treatment area has been included within the catchment uh, that you've represented upstream of it. Now. In the case of a treatment system that is relatively large compared to its catchment, that may not necessarily be that accurate. And what you may be better to do is represent the catchment draining to the system as one catchment node, and then represent the, the tree pit or the rain garden itself as a catchment node. So the way you do that is you put in a second catchment which is sized to be the same as the treatment, keep in mind your catchment is in hectares, your treatment is in square metres, don't forget. Um, so you put it in at the same size and then the second thing I do is I make it 100% impervious fraction and then in the soil properties, what we do is we set the soil properties, the rainfall threshold to be zero. And what that means is all of the rainfall falling on that system will reach the system and for a rain garden that's realistic because it's then representing the evapotranspiration of it within the treatment node itself. So that will then be captured in what the treatment node's representing. So I'll just wait and see if there's any more questions coming through. Okay, so that didn't take long, one's just popped through then. So there's a question, what strategy is there to deal with the long-term accumulation of pollutant buildup in the soil. So it's worth saying there's been extensive research done on non-vegetated systems which do not have a mechanism for removing pollutants from the soil but essentially accumulate it up to a point. And then there is also vegetated systems which have plants within them which have the capacity to take up the pollutants that are embedded in the soil. So two things, one is that the soil itself has an innate absorption capacity for the pollutants and that's been estimated to be anywhere between 15 to 20 years and even out to 50 years depending on what pollutants you're looking at and which, which of the studies you're reading. What some of the more recent research at the CRC is finding is that the, they're monitoring some of the rain gardens and finding that the pollutants don't seem to be continuing to accumulate beyond, beyond a certain point. And what they're seeing is that the plants are up, actually uptaking very small quantities of the pollutants, but because they're there 365 days a year, what you see is that they are essentially taking out more of the pollutants um, and keeping up up to a point with the pollutants that are coming in. So eventually you reach an equilibrium where you're actually balancing out. So it looks like these systems may not necessarily accumulate um, to a point where we have to replace them and some probably still will if you're in an industrial area, so I wouldn't say that's an absolute. Um, what will happen in reality is these systems will end up getting reset any, any every 20 to 30 years because something else will happen in the road and you'll end up digging up your system because you're doing something else. So 
Next question, we've got a couple coming through, so I'll try and get through these quickly because I'm conscious we're over time. In terms of a straight up cost comparison between a bioretention basin versus these tree pit solutions for equivalent performance, how do they stack up? The bio basin is pretty economical versus hardware solutions like cartridge filters if you have the area. So what we're actually finding, these systems do cost more than a rain garden, but if you take into account the cost of putting in a rain garden and separately putting in your tree pits, what we find is that if you put in these systems you can get more stormwater treatment and more canopy than you can get with the alternative, which is putting in a, a rain garden and then putting in a set of trees around it. What we find is that you can actually get greater benefits putting in these tree pits than you can with your separated systems. Um, okay, another question on this modelling method for large systems relative to your catchment. Sorry, I'll just come back to that previous question. The other thing I will say is that if your tree pit systems allow you to, to have some area that is reallocated for other purposes, the value of that land can be quite significant. So where some of that land is becoming other vegetated space or it's becoming car parking or it's used for other purposes, that can help to offset some of your costs if, if an economic outcome is valued by your client. Um, Jack's made the point that with the rainfall on the node, presumably the treatment area would have a different set of pollutants to a standard urban area surface and is right. The pollutant concentrations for that direct rainfall would be roughly what you would expect to see in rainfall. Um, in areas where you do have different pollutant concentrations available, say Queensland for example, I would suggest that um, the appropriate representation would be a roof pollutant concentration would be the closest thing to represent what's coming off direct rainfall because you'll still have the nitrogen that's atmospheric and you'll have a low sediment concentration which will be representative. Um, okay, so just a question on the area percentage. Higher percentage equals less water. Would have thought higher percentage of catchment area equals more water. So just to clarify the percentages that I showed, and I'll see if I can get this just to take us back to one of our graphs just quickly. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, okay, so in terms of the percentages, what we're talking about is the treatment system as a percentage of its catchment. So if we're saying 20%, we're saying that the treatment system is 20% of its catchment. If it's 1%, then it's 1% of its catchment. So the catchment size is fixed, the treatment size is varying. So what we're saying is that the larger the treatment is relative to the catchment, the less water it's getting. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I'll just wait a few seconds. If there's any final questions, please bung them in quickly. Um, otherwise, we'll be wrapping up. So we're about 10 minutes over time. Okay, I think that might be it. So I'll, I'll hand over to me how to wrap things up. Uh, sorry, one question. Oh, yep, that's okay. Yep, that's right. I'll hand over to me how. Well, cool. thank you very much, Dale. That was I found that to be very interesting. Hope everyone um, everyone enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for attending to today's webinar. I know, we know we're, you're busy, and we really appreciate you uh, coming and and getting involved in the industry. If you have any other questions about music, um, please email um, support at uara.org.au. Um, for any specific questions about this uh, webinar, uh, feel free to uh, email Dale at um, uh, dell at e2designlab.com.au. Uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email uh, with a link to uh, a recording of today's webinar, so uh, you can review it, uh, share it with your friends. Uh, on behalf of Rewater and on behalf of Dell uh, from e Design Lab, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you'll come for the next webinar. Thank you. <laughs>